This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 32 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are a longtime listener, welcome back. And if you are new to the show, welcome to you. I am so glad that you have joined us on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And once again, I do thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey. As I record this podcast, it is Memorial Day weekend of 2020. And this is probably for many of us going to be a very unique Memorial Day weekend. But in some ways, I think that may be a good thing because it will give us an opportunity maybe to pause and reflect on what Memorial Day weekend is really all about. Sometimes I hear people say, Happy Memorial Day, or I hear people use the term, We're going to celebrate Memorial Day. And I'm not trying to be a wet blanket here, but that really irks me because Memorial Day is really anything but a happy occasion. And we commemorate Memorial Day. We don't celebrate it because it is really a day of mourning as we consider those who have laid down their lives so that we can, here in the United States at least, we're commemorating the fact that they have laid down their lives so that we can live a life of freedom. And so this weekend, reflect on that. You know, there are many mothers and fathers and husbands and wives, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters friends who are grieving the losses of loved ones. And it doesn't matter whether or not it was a loss that was experienced recently here in the wars of Afghanistan and Iraq or in the first Gulf War or Vietnam or World War II or Korea. Those losses and those wounds never fully heal. And I just want you to know if you are someone who is grieving the loss of a loved one. We remember. We thank them for their sacrifice. We thank you. We love you. They are not forgotten. Having said that, let's move on with the show and jump on into this week's Homestead Happenings. It was another busy, busy week here on the homestead, as you can imagine. Um, as I mentioned last week, our f- last average frost date was May 17th, and so it has been full speed ahead on the gardens. I was able to finally get the square foot gardens fully planted this week, so thankful to have them done, at least the first planning, planning on doing some succession planning this year, at least hoping to do that something I haven't done a great job of in the past, hoping to do a little bit better this year. But it is good to have that first planting of the square foot garden done. And I have moved on to planting the Ruth Stout beds. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm finding planting the Ruth Stout beds just a little bit, I don't know, it's a bit finicky maybe. I'm used to dealing with the square foot gardens and I have nothing in the way and it's just so easy to plant. And I'm finding that I'm having to move the hay to get down to the dirt. And I don't know, I'm just not, I'm not loving this. (laughs) Um, We'll see how things go and maybe in the end, I'm going to absolutely love the production that I get out of the roost out bed. But I'm just not finding planting the Ruth Stout bed as easy as planting the square foot garden. And maybe it's just I haven't figured out the right way. If you're somebody who has done Ruth Stout gardening, um, I would love to hear from you. If you have any tips or tricks on the best way to plant these things, I would really, really appreciate it. I mentioned back on episode 26 that I was planning on using the square foot gardening spacing in my Ruth Stout bed. And quite frankly, right now, I'm I'm having second thoughts on that just because I'm having to move so much hay and I don't know, it's just, 
it's not working out like I had hoped. Now, I have gotten um, tomatoes planted. I've gotten some squash planted, some watermelon planted. So the transplant seemed to work well. But if you're planting anything from seed, I am just not, I'm not quite sure, quite frankly, how to do this. So if you are somebody who has done Ruth Stout Gardening in the past, I would absolutely love to hear from you. I'm going to be reaching out on some of the forums to uh, get some feedback from people on maybe the best way to approach this. But um, we're moving ahead, at least on the Ruth Stout bed, and I am excited about that. I got some sweet potatoes planted in there, uh, my t some tomatoes in there. I've got, again, watermelon squash, those kinds of things, and also my asparagus that I planted in the one end um, last weekend I planted that there. So anyhow, very excited about all of that. Glad to get the gardening well underway. This week I also tried something brand new. I've never done this before, and that is I tried making some lilac jelly. And folks, I was absolutely blown away by it. In fact, I'm in the process of making a second batch. Now, a lot of people have asked me what it tastes like. And I would say that to me, it tastes a little bit like honey with a tang, if that makes any sense. But I will put the link to the a recipe that I followed in the show notes. Um, if you follow us on Instagram or Facebook, I've been putting pictures up of the process. So if you're interested in seeing that, take a look. But the lilac jelly was tried this week and I really, really loved it. This week I also bought a dehydrator. So that's on the way. Very excited about adding that to our food preservation um, repertoire, shall we say, to the stable of stars. Uh, we will now be fermenting, freezing, dehydrating, and canning. So excited about that. Now, speaking of canning, um, one of the things that uh, I have really been looking for is lids. And I've been looking around online for the best place to buy lids, the best value for the money, thinking about buying them in bulk. And I have kind of settled on a company and had some questions about which they, they had two versions of lids that you could buy in bulk. And so I asked on a particular site with regards to what, if anybody had any experience with them and what people thought. And somebody said, hey, what about Dollar General? Do you have a Dollar General near you? Well, there are Dollar Generals everywhere, folks, right? I mean, they it just seems like they're on, every, they're becoming the 7-Eleven of our generation. <laughs> it's like there's one on every street corner. And uh, they mentioned that the lids there are uh, of, of a great value. And so I went and I looked and I found some. And so I bought a case of canning lids at Dollar General. So if you're somebody who cans, I would recommend checking out Dollar General for canning lids. They only did have the regular size. I'm not sure if they carry the wide mouth uh, lids. So I'll need to look around for those. But I am stocked up for this season for canning lids. And I got them at Dollar General. Something else I did this week that I have not done in a very, very long time. I did this on Saturday. Saturday, my wife and son weren't here. They had gone down to visit her mom and dad. And I sat on my front porch and enjoyed a cup of coffee. And I just enjoyed the homestead. I listened to the ducks and the geese. I listened to the chickens. I listened to the pigs. I listened to the sound of the wind chimes that we have on the front porch, and I just took a moment to enjoy the homestead. And folks, I need to do that more often because, you know, a lot of times we have the to-do lists, and there just seems like there's never enough time in the day to get everything done that we want to get done. But sometimes I think it's just a good idea for us to stop and to enjoy our homesteads. And so I did that on Saturday. Very, very glad to do that. One last thing before we jump on over to this week's Charting the Course, and that is an animal update. So we have the baby ducks and the baby geese out of the brooder and out into a little yard. Um, what I did is I actually had an old rabbit hutch that I had built, as I shared on the whole meat rabbit uh, episode, I had this hutch that I kind of threw together last minute, and the bottom of it had kind of 
started to disintegrate. It was hardware cloth and it had started to fall apart. And so what I did is I took that off the legs, I cut out the hardware cloth, and voila, I had a duck slash goose house. And so glad to have those baby ducks and geese out of the brooder. Um, some bad news. We lost one of the goslings that the geese hatched out. So only one of them have survived. We named him Ollie. He's a little booger. He keeps getting out, but then he can't get back through the fence to get back in. And so we're having to keep helping him get back in. And then the moms and the dads, they're over there squawking and flapping their wings and hissing. And uh, it's just, uh, Ollie, stay where you're supposed to be, bud. <laughs> he's a cute little thing love having him running around the baby pigs are doing great um they keep getting out and kind of running around the yard a little bit but they're not hurting anything and they're not there's nothing for them to get into so i'm just kind of letting them do the thing right now and finally um the meat birds are looking great so next weekend they are going to be going to freezer camp and we'll see what our average sizes are but they do, uh, they're going great. I this this week I started letting them back out. I had kept them in the in the um, tractor because of that hawk uh, attack where we lost a couple like two weeks ago, and I just finally said enough of this. I want them out running around doing as much chickeny things as they can do, and uh, so knock knock on wood. Um, we've had no more issues and they are doing well. So that's what's been going on here on the homestead this week. Lots and lots of stuff going on, but also took some time just to kick back, relax, and enjoy the homestead. And I am so glad I did. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On last week's episode, I was very privileged to have joined me Kathy R. Payne, the award-winning author of Saving the Guinea Hogs, the Recovery of an American Homestead Breed, as we talked about heritage breeds, their importance, why we should conserve them, and what we as homesteaders can do to help. And this was all in conjunction with kind of kicking off International Heritage Breeds Week, which is an awareness campaign that is sponsored by the Livestock Conservancy. And so I was very, very happy to be a part of that. But it's one thing for someone to talk the talk. It's another thing for someone to walk the walk. And one of the things that I am very, very uh, impressed with with regards to Kathy is she is someone who has lived out heritage breeds in her homesteading journey. Um, heritage breeds have played an integral part in who she was as a homesteader. And so I am so happy to welcome back to the Homestead Journey podcast, Kathy R. Payne, as we talk about the impact that heritage breeds had on her homesteading journey. Kathy, welcome back. Well, my pleasure. I really enjoyed the first one. And I did as well, and I think it was a lot of great information for people as we uh, talked about the importance of heritage breeds and uh, celebrating um, at the end of this while well, we're, we're wrapping up the celebration week of International Heritage Breeds Week. Yes, very worthy of focusing on. And so today we're going to kind of turn um, our conversation a little bit towards how heritage breeds played an important role in your homesteading journey. So, um, well, American guinea hogs is kind of, I don't want to say what you're known for, but you've written the book on American guinea hogs. That's really not where you got your start with regards to heritage breeds, correct? No, it is not. Yet back in 2010, my husband John and I decided to retire from our regular jobs of 30 plus years and purchase a small property in rural Georgia to raise nutrient dense foods and heritage breeds of livestock. And I'd learned about heritage livestock when we were doing our podcast, Our Natural Life, and I decided to start with heritage breed meat rabbits. And I raised Silver Fox for a short time, the Blue Eyed White Beveren, and then the American Blues and Whites. The American Blue was by far my favorite, 
And the rabbits gave me a quick education in breeding, genetics, inheritability, pedigree, selection, and culling. So I'm really glad I started with the rabbits because guess what? I was, I, they can give, their gestation is 31 days and I was breeding them back in the cool weather on day 14. So every wow. 45 days, yeah. <laughs> I had a litter of 10, 12, 16 rabbits yes, from yes. each of my does. So you could really, and then they start uh, breeding and giving birth again when they're six to eight months old. So you've got a really quick turnaround to see what your offspring turned into and you get great grandparents real quick. So that served me well when I expanded to Gulf Coast sheep and guinea hogs. This Gulf Coast sheep only have one or two progeny every 12 months. That, and, you know, it's really hard to give up a lamb, you know, decide which ones you're going to eat versus keep when you've only got one a year. So so the, the, American, the, the American blue rabbits then really were – kind of a, a great starting point as far as understanding how your decision-making process as a breeder was going to impact your offspring. Absolutely. And by having different breeds of rabbits to compare to, I really realized that I liked the temperament and the health of the blue, the American blues. Now, did you just raise your rabbits for meat or were you doing other things with them? I sold pedigreed breeding stock, I sold meat, I sold the furs, and I dehydrated the ears and hind feet for dog treats, and I dehydrated the front feet and the tails as cat toys, and in Georgia, I could sell the meat to customers and chefs, and I even sold heads to researchers in Atlanta at Emory who needed pigmented eyes because their suppliers only had the red-eyed rabbits, and they would actually cut travel from Atlanta to our farm about two hours away and send somebody to pick up the heads on our processing day and we would just put them on ice and then they would take them for their research. So every part well, of that rabbit, went to nothing went to waste. So I really like that. So I know you're interested in rabbits, so I wanted to give you that detail. That's great information. So with the American blue rabbits, mm -hmm. then they don't have the red uh, Well, the white ones do. Um, okay. The white ones are ruby-eyed whites, but the blues okay. have a gray eye. And okay. I've, I, my genetics yielded more blues than whites, and I didn't. I never bred white to white because I wasn't as fond of the white. Now, I always thought the American blue was a blue rabbit. It is. Yes, the American blue is a blue rabbit with blue eyes. Well, with bl gray eyes. But it does have white as well. Yes, there are also a white. Huh. Mm -hmm. So See, I'm learning a lot here. Some people only blue, only breed the white. Now, if you breed white to white, you'll always get white. But the whites can carry the trait for blue underneath that white fur. So if you breed a blue to a white, you'll get a mixed colors in there. You'll get blue and white. Yeah. And you can really learn all those genetics so much easier, like I said, on a fast track. And then you learn, okay, it's okay to call the offspring that you're a little on the fence about because you'll get even better offspring from the ones that you keep. And mm -hmm. that's an important lesson for anybody that's interested in breeding livestock for breeding stock. And even if they want really good meat qualities or really good temperament, whatever you're breeding for, you'll get through selection. But if you try mm -hmm. to keep everything, you're, you're going to end up with junk. Yes. And, and, that's, and that's something that I'm learning, you know, as, as, a, as a, an American guinea hog breeder is, you know, the importance of making sure that you breed the best and you eat the rest. Exactly. Now, with the uh, the American blue rabbits, um, so uh, you've got the blue and the and the white coloring. Is there anything else that's acceptable within the breed, or is it just the blue and the white? That's all, but there are people working on a red strand because they okay. think the red, white, and blue for an American rabbit would be a cool thing. But it really uh, came from a 
I think it was called a violet rabbit in Germany, and it, and it was originally named something like the German blue. But then mm -hmm. when World War II started, that was not a popular thing, so they became the American blues. <laughs> and so then you moved from the American blue then onto the Gulf Coast sheep. Yes, well, I had the Gulf Coast sheep and the Ameri and the rabbits at the same time. Okay. And... I really loved the Gulf Coast. The Gulf Coast native breed descended from Spanish stock that was imported in the 1500s and then let loose in the Gulf Coast. Whatever do doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and the stock of these sheep adapted to carrying a low parasite load and had minimal hoof rot compared to bloodlines that were imported later. They had had, had 500... I guess more than 500 years to adapt to those hot and humid conditions in the Gulf Coast that were normally lethal to sheep. What were your goals with the sheep? So I selected for wool and breeding stock primarily, but really enjoyed the meat when we did call. It's milder than the modern breeds, especially the ones that are fed on corn in America, but even compared to the Australian and Zealand grass-fed sheep. Now, did you process your own wool? I didn't process my own wool, but I learned what spinners wanted, and I marketed wool to those who did process. So what I would do is I would trade them raw wool with an agreement to return about one-third of it back to me in finished form, such as roving, yarn, or dryer balls. And that increased my profits because more people knit than spin, and many people use a clothes dryer. So I would sell a pound of wool for $16 when I did sell raw wool, but I could sell a pound of yarn for $160 because I got $10 per ounce, a three and a half ounce skein of, of dyed and hand spun, really soft yarn would go for $35. Yeah, and it was, wow. so yeah, that's what we call value add, and that's a good way to increase your income on the farm instead of selling herbs, which you could sell herbs, but if you take the herbs and make them into a salve or make them into a tincture, then you can get more money for the same herbs. So it's always working, right. and then working with other people. I love making connections and letting other people do what I don't do best, such as spinning and washing wool. Yeah, and that's and that's a great point because I mean it's everybody's helping each other, and mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, the the breed is benefiting from that. Absolutely, and so is the the community of people who process and so forth. Absolutely. So, how many how many sheep did you have at that? At that point, my sheep herd was I kept it at about 15 and then not counting the lambs. So, with 15 sheep, I'd have one or two rams and then I'd have the ewes, and then they would give me, you know, one to three offspring a year. So, I would double that usually in the spring. And so, then how many because I, I know nothing about sheep. Um, how many times a year would you shear them? Is it just once a year or once, twice a year? or Once a year. Mm -hmm. Once a year. And so out of those 15 that you had, how many pounds of wool would you get once a year? from? Well, them? it's a smaller breed, just like the guinea hog. You have smaller products out of it. I'm not sure what a, a big wool sheep would, pr would typically produce. But these would be three to five pounds per sheep, and I would bag them and label each by the sheep and the year. So when I traded to people, I would ask them to put the name of the sheep on the bag of wool. But you figure fifteen times three, I'd get you know close to fifty pounds of wool a year from my. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you would also. Um, you were also culling them for meat. Um, were you selling the meat to anybody else, or is it more just for your own personal consumption? It was pretty much for family, but I had a few customers that I would mm -hmm. sell whole. whole. Uh, but I think I forgot to finish that. When I 
so when somebody spun a skein of wool for me, they would label it with the name of the sheep that produced that wool and Gulf Coast sheep. So I was branding the breed and I was also branding the individual sheep because some sheep have different qualities of their wool than others, especially since it's land race. We'll get to land race discussions a little later. And people would buy this same fleeces from a year after year. So if they liked Ginger's fleece in 2014, they'd want to buy it again in 2015. Interesting. That that that's a that's a great point. And you know, that is one thing that I did pick up on at our county fair last year mm-hmm. um as I was watching them breed. Um not breed, sorry, uh, watching that that'd be very awkward at a county <laughs> fair. Uh <laughs> watching them um judge the 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 um coat, uh, not the coat, it's the fleece, I guess. Mm-hmm. Of, of of the um of the animals as they were talking about and I actually think I was watching them um judge goats, but I think the concept would still hold true with, with sheep mm-hmm. is that each as you said, each individual um uh animal has its own individual characteristics with regards to the the quality of of um wool that it is producing. Absolutely. And and so then to be able to market it down to that level, I think is 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 great. I think it, it it's a just another added value on top of you know um, something that you can't get from the big guy, so to speak, right. because there everything's just thrown into a big a big ball and processed. Yeah, anything to get that personal connection with your customer is what hooks them, and they'll come back. It, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and again, everybody benefits. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody's getting a quality that they like that they can't get somewhere else. And, you know, you're able to sell it at a bit of a, a premium because of that. And at the end of the day, everybody benefits from it. Mm-hmm. Now, sheep can also be raised um, for milk. D- did you get into that? Can Gulf Coast sheep be milked? I mean, what's the situation there with them? I just saw a picture of a Gulf Coast sheep on a, on a- page for the Gulf Coast Sheep Association. And I asked them, I said, are you milking that sheep? Because it had an udder as good as my salmon dairy goat had. But no, dairy is is really niche and it involves a lot of expense and sterilization and, and, and so forth. And you have to have sheep that are really raised as milk animals, you know, with dairy animals, they usually take them away from their mothers at birth and then they handle them and they manage them and they train them. So that's a whole different area. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are some people trying to work with those genetics for milk, but they're basically a couple really specific mm-hmm. breeds that are good for milk milking, but they are not good for hoof health or parasite resistance at least in the south gotcha so so the gulf coast sheep would be seen more as a dual purpose breed not really a tri-purpose breed correct yes okay um now you had the gulf coast sheep you had the american blue rabbits um Mm -hmm. and we'll get to the guinea hogs in a second but were there any other animals that you had that you were that, that would be heritage breeds that you were kind of working with those are the only ones that I actually moved breeding stock forward with. I did have khaki Campbell ducks, and they are a heritage duck breed, but I did not keep any of their eggs for hatching. And I also had various heritage breeds of chickens for, for egg laying. We didn't produce any chicken meat, just uh, eggs. And then we had herbs and vegetable garden, but that was mostly for the family. Okay. Um, so as far as then for production, either for for moving the breed forward or um, for producing to sell products to other consumers, it would have been the rabbits, the sheep, and then the American guinea hog. Correct. So now we're to the American guinea hog. You know, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I know it's a topic that's definitely near and dear to your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so... 
my story with the American guinea hog is that I, I found the American guinea hog and that led me to heritage breeds. Mm -hmm. And your story is kind of a little bit of the opposite of that in that you found heritage breeds, which led you to the American guinea hog. That's right. And I don't think it really matters which way you get there. Um, you, you know, we got there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What was it about the American guinea hog that kind of drew you to them? Because there are a lot of other heritage breed pigs that are out there that you could have chosen. Well, I did have a small homestead. We only had 11 acres and we left about an acre and a half outside for the wildlife outside our fence. And then we had some land around our, our house. So that only left us with eight pasture eight acres of pasture that was fenced in so I didn't have room for a big hog and I didn't want a 600 pound hog on my farm um, I didn't want to deal with the size and we really just didn't have the room with the sheep and the rabbits and everything else so I had heard about the breed but really couldn't find much information about it. And then I had a American Blue Rabbit customer that came, and I think she came from out of state because I would sell these rabbits like three states away. I actually shipped some to California. So she was telling me that she had just picked up some guinea hogs in a herd dispersal. They were unregistered, and they were from Craigslist or something. And she was just raving about them. I thought, well, maybe I better look into that again. <laughs> so that's how I found out about the guinea hogs. But I never really considered anything else because they wouldn't have been a good fit for my land. Interesting. You know, for me, I, I read about them in Grit Magazine. I think it was Grit Magazine. I think mm -hmm. it was an article in Grit Magazine. It was either that or Mother Earth News. Um, I get both of them. It might even have been Hobby Farms. Actually, they haven't had Farms. an article in Grit yet. So it was Mother Earth News and it was written by Jeanette Berenger. Okay. Well, there it is. Then now mystery solved because I, I knew it was in one of them. Uh -huh. I just could never remember which one. But I got that, that episode and as I was reading just the, the breed description and, and I was just reading about the American guinea hog, I, it, was, it was everything that I'd ever wanted in, in, in a pig. Mm -hmm. And I... So I, I kind of on a lark said, well, let me see if there's anybody within four hours that mm -hmm. happens to have the American guinea hog. Right. And uh, I, I went to the um, American guinea hog uh, association website, looked up a breeder and wouldn't you know, there was actually somebody in my town wow. that was an American guinea hog breeder. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I contacted her right away and she was gracious enough to let me come down to her farm and look at the pigs. And as soon as I laid eyes on him, I fell in love. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm with you. I never really considered anything else. Mm -hmm. It was just, uh, I, it, was, it was love at first sight. And uh, I've been extremely happy with him. And, you know, for me, a big part of it, you mentioned, you know, you didn't want a 600-pound hog. That was a big part of it for me. I, I have actually uh, a little over two acres. Mm -hmm. So there was no way that I could support, um, you know, a, a large number of pigs uh, but a large number of large pigs would have been impossible. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want anything on my farm that I would have to be afraid of. Right. You know, now with the, you know, I, I treat the American guinea hog with respect, mm -hmm. uh, um, but I'm not afraid of it. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of the bigger breeds that I would be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And they would tear up that two acres in a minute. Oh, absolutely. Especially absolutely. if they had litters of 14 to 16 piglets. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, so you then, you discovered the American guinea hogs um, and almost, as I understand it, from day one, you, you started deciding, hey, we need, to, we need to capture the story and write about it. Um, that is and, true. And so why was that important to you? Well, I was trained in my doctoral program to go to original source material, and there was very little known in 2013. And what was out there was difficult to track down. It was pretty much a repetition of what Jeanette Berenger wrote in the breed description for the Livestock Conservancy. So as far as the history goes, there was almost nothing. I Somebody on a Yahoo group, remember Yahoo groups? <laughs> somebody oh. on the guinea pig <laughs> guinea hog yahoo group posted um a letter 
that Kirk Fackrell of Cascade Meadows Farm had sent to the group years before. I think it was in 2008. And he listed the different states and the names of the pigs that came from the different states because they referred to them by the state. So there was a Nebraska group and an Indiana group and a Virginia group. And that got me curious because I'd see these names on pedigrees every once in a while, but nobody had the backstory of how the association started. There had already been a lot of turnover in the association. So I started going to the people whose names were on the pedigrees, and then somebody would say, oh, I've got some information that might help you, and they'd send me something like that email, and then they'd say, oh, you need to talk to Shirley Sullivan. She's the one that had Bela Sampson, and so I would call somebody, I'd ask them questions, I'd get information. Everything was taped and transcribed, so I had exact words. So in my book, you'll hear stories from people in their exact words, and that kind of brings it alive because everybody has their own cadence, and especially when you're talking to southern farmers that are in their 70s or 80s and grew up with the pigs in the 50s, you know, you really get the sound of their voice in the book. And that was fun for me. I was, as I was looking through, through your book, um, one of the stories that just jumped out at me was the story, I believe it was Mr. Archer. Um, yes, Cohen Archer. Who, I love that Oh man. my goodness. I had tears in my eyes as I read that story. That was just, that was, a, that was just amazing. I had to train to read it out loud for book readings um, without crying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but you'll be happy to know that I got a hold of Cohen last year after the book came out. And even though he hadn't seen a guinea hog in like 46 years and was trying to find one, one of my pigs that I had sold is on his farm now. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And it's, it's funny how, you know, it's a small community and people looking for guinea hogs and people who have yep. guinea hogs. And so, and it's, it was the very first guinea hog I ever owned. And I trained her to sit on command when she was about eight weeks old and she still sits. She sits for dinner. Wow. <laughs> wow. That, that's a great story. Yeah. I, I just, when I read that one, I, it left me a little misty eyed. I, I've, I've got to confess. Yes. And, uh, and I think that's great because I, you know, again, connecting um, people person, you know, where, where you, where you, you read the story and there's kind of that emotional connection uh, to that, um, to that story, I think then helps bring kind of an, an emotional connection to the breed, which again is is what we what we want. We want people to care about the American guinea hunt. Absolutely, and you know, Kirk Beckrell, who I mentioned, that email that kind of got me started on the genetics part. He's been a really good mentor to me, and he's bought copies of my books. And he and his partner J Jason said that they were crying while they read the book as well. And their part of the history, they actually named the breed. It was, it's been known as guinea hog for over 200 years, but it's only been known as American guinea hog uh, since about 2005. And if you want to know why, then you just read that story in the book. You could just look in the index and find his name, and, or it, I think it's in chapter one. So don't want to get off track too much here. Yeah, we, we, we could definitely go into all of that because it's just, it's so fascinating as I was again um, flipping through it and just looking over some of the, uh, um, you know, the background of the breed and, and uh, you know, we, we could definitely get, uh, we, we could spend hours about that, uh, talking about that. But back in episode number 20, um, I, I did talk about the American guinea hog. And so before I go any further, is there anything that I said that needs to be corrected? I wouldn't say corrected, but possibly I have a different perspective or opinion about a couple things in the episode. All right. Go ahead. Drop it on. Me. All right. Well, I think in episode 20, you were talking about how guinea hogs were not the perfect homestead pig. Was that maybe the name of the article you read in Mother Earth well, News? Or? I, the, the, yeah, the, ti the, title I, the title I put on that was, Are They the Perfect Homestead Pig? Ah, okay. 
Well, I agree with you that nothing's the perfect homestead pick because everybody has different needs and so forth. Um, but it the, it is um, considered America's favorite homestead hog. That's a slogan that the Guinea Hog Association use, use it, uses. And I think because there are only a handful of exclusively American heritage pigs and the guinea hog is decidedly appropriate for a homestead compared to commercial pig that it's fair enough to complain that it is America's home favorite homestead pig but again that's the that's for everybody to decide on their own but there was something that I questioned was your use of market weight you said this is not a pig that will get up to market weight in six months which is true or you said it takes a long time to get to market weight and my argument for that is that market weight can kind of be what you when you personally want to market so if you think about in 4-H projects they talk about a market hog at 245 pounds with a range of 210 to 280 and I think that the more common breeds like Berkshire Old Spots Chester White or Yorkshire can achieve that goal and they even have contests where you grow out a pig and it has to get that weight at that point in time uh, there are many guinea hogs from the net hester's line that never get larger than 140 to 200 pounds others might reach 245 pounds by the time they're 16 to 18 months but that's not market weight for a guinea hog. For me, market weight was whatever I got when I needed to process the hog. So if I had too many pigs growing out of my land, it was time to take some of them to the, the butcher. Uh, if I had an escape artist or a piglet with a missing testicle, I'd process it as soon as practical because I didn't want to keep it around. So my chefs love to play around with suckling pig as small as 30 pounds and they could take that suckling pig and make several meals out of it and it would be a special on the menu and they'd get what they wanted which was to play with a little suckling pig and the customers got what they wanted which was to have delicious pork and I got what I wanted which is get the pig off the farm get a few dollars for it so and my typical time to process was about 10 months and oh wow and 10 months I could sell a whole pig just with the skin with the hair off to a chef and they could make that pig last for like eight months because they'd take the hams and they'd cure them five months later they could have prosciutto or country ham they'd slice it thin just garnish something with it and I could go to the restaurant and still be eating that same pig, you know, a couple months later. So they can make it last, uh, but it's the quality of the meat, not the quantity that you're looking at with the guinea hog, because the mm -hmm. quality of the meat is so different. Um, I would also sometimes process something to be like 10 pounds when processed, you know, maybe a three or four month pig. And mm -hmm. you'd roast it like a turkey. And think, you okay. don't think a turkey's small because it's 10 pounds, you know, and not 20 or 30 pounds, although you can get mm -hmm. turkeys that are 20 or 30 pounds. But why not just have this pig on a, a platter? And it's the quality of the suckling pig is so much different than the quality of an older pig. So uh -huh. I guess my thoughts was that it's not really fair to, to talk about market weight as, as being something you have to wait 18 to 24 months to achieve because you wouldn't put you choose a beagle to pull a dog sled team you wouldn't expect a Clydesdale to win the Kentucky Derby and you shouldn't expect a guinea hog to to reach a weight that is not really achievable for a guinea hog so that's my answer <laughs> no I think I think that's a fair a fair, a fair analysis and, and, a, and a great perspective um, because I think for for the for people who are looking at it more for their homestead mm -hmm. um, to to harvest the the American guinea hog at various stages is something that um, I, I think that's what draws m many people on homesteads to to the American guinea hog is that it is something that a homesteader can manage 
um, and, and process uh, on their own, whether it's through the various stages from suckling pig all the way up. Um, you know, you're not having to worry about, again, haul around that 600 pound pig or 400 pound pig or even a 250 pound market hog. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I think that's what draws a lot of people to the American Guinea hog is that I guess what I was trying to get at is a lot of times, you know, the, I guess the easiest sell, uh, or depending on what your market is in your area, um, many people are looking for that traditional freezer pork, right? Um, you know, and so that's that's kind of when I was using those terms uh, with regards to market weight. It was more of reaching that freezer pork type um, type size, mm -hmm. uh, which it's just not going to get there in the, in the six months that you would get with the um, with the larger pigs. But definitely, with regards to uh, you know harvesting them throughout the process, I think that's it's a it's a, a very valid point, a great point, mm -hmm. because we've had to do that here where we had uh, you know a a male that was born with one testicle mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't going to allow it to, you know, I didn't want it breeding. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want it, uh, you know, fighting with my other boar. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we harvested it earlier than I would have if it was a cut male. Right. Um, I probably would have let it go longer. Um, I think another, another point that um, is important to make here as well is that how, when, when you're when you're going to market these pigs to um, to chefs mm -hmm. and um, and to restaurants, I think one of the things that it's very frustrating, but um, how you can do that is there's so much variability from state to state mm -hmm. on how that is handled, um, just because of how the regulations are. With with regards to where you were, where you are there in in Georgia, could you, did you have to sell it on the hoof to the to the chefs, or how how was that handled? Yes, I had to sell it on the hoof, and then the chef could break it down because the chef had the license to break down meat, and okay. to handle the meat. So I would just take it and have it processed like a, a barbecue pig. So it would be scalded, stamped USDA, and it still had the head on, the hoofs on, everything, whatever mm -hmm. the chef wanted. And then I would just have it wrapped in saran wrap. So it was a, a minimal processing charge on my part. Mm -hmm. And then they just, you know, it was like I was treated like a celebrity when I did, showed up to deliver this hog. And, and then they'd mm -hmm. take it in and they'd put it in their kitchen. They'd break it down and then they'd hang it and cure it and do whatever else they were going to do. And Excellent. and then they'd serve it as a special. So I was not mass producing meat. I mm -hmm. would just call them and said, "Hey, I've I've got a guinea hog in about two months. Are you interested in it?" You know, and I had a list of chefs that I could go to, and and I had one that usually would just buy what I had, and he didn't care if it was ten months or fourteen months, um, mm -hmm. or two years, because sometimes you want to call a breeder that's older. But I didn't mm -hmm. usually keep animals that long and I had farm tours they'd come out and meet the hogs and I'd I'd train them to put on the menu that it, it was a guinea hog special not just suckling pig but it was a guinea hog suckling pig and so they played that up for me and it was fun to to sit at the restaurant when they were serving the specials and have people say what's a guinea hog and over here that the, the the servers that were giving them the little lecture. Well, it's a heritage hog and it almost went extinct. <laughs> I, th I think that's great though. I think it's, it's, um, it's something again that, uh, you know, going back to what we were talking about with regards to the sheep, mm -hmm. um, but how, you know, what you can do to kind of add that value and make that connection mm -hmm. um, is, is, you know, it's special for, the the customer, mm -hmm. um, but it also comes back to giving that breed importance and value um, in the eyes of the customer. Where mm -hmm. you know people have become so disconnected from all of that, um, and I think that's I think that's great. So any any other I I don't want to say issues or, or concerns that you had, things that you felt like I, I didn't get right? It was just that you felt like maybe my perspective on market hog just wasn't, wasn't fair. 
Yeah, well, because you were using that in your kind of your the the drawbacks of the pig, but you could also mm-hmm. say that a plus is that you know you may have customers that you know, friends that you know that don't want more than fifty pounds of meat in their freezer. Mm-hmm. You know, they wouldn't have it. They'd have to go out and buy a freezer if they right. if they had to, 150 pounds of meat. And right. so and, and that, that is, could be a plus. That, that's, well, that's a, that's a great point. And that's another, and I think I mentioned it, but I, mm-hmm. I may not have. I, I thought I mentioned it as, as part of the pluses in my, in my, um, that podcast is that um, for us, it, we're a family of three. Mm-hmm. So to have a huge pig, I mean, if if we were to get an entire market hog, we'd be eating off of that for probably two years. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's definitely again something else that drew us to the to the American guinea hog, and it's been something that has been um, something that uh, customers that have purchased from us have wanted and and have enjoyed as well. Is that even when I am getting it to that? Uh, I hate to use the term market. I just don't know what, what other term to use, but that larger freezer size. Mm-hmm. Um, that it's still not, you know, several hundred pounds of meat that right. they're having to deal with. Right. So the American guinea hog, it, we, we've used the term land race breed, mm-hmm. and the American guinea hog is considered to be a land race breed. And that's something that it, it's terminology that it took me a while to kind of wrap my head around. Mm-hmm. Um, could you kind of explain what that means and and why that's, important with regards to the American guinea hog? Certainly. This is something you can put in your show notes. For anything related to breed, breeding and heritage breeds, I, I, refer, I refer to my Bible, which is Managing Breeds for a Secure Future, Strategies for Breeders and Breed Associations. And that's the 2017 second edition by Dr. Philip Spunberg, who's a consultant to the Livestock Conservancy since 1977, Allison Martin, who's the current executive director of the Livestock Conservancy, and Jeanette Beringer, who's the program lead at the Livestock Conservancy. And they've done an excellent job of breaking down a lot of the genetics and the different types of breeds. So my English Shepherd Dog is a land race breed. The Gulf Coast sheep are land race breed, as are Spanish goats and piney woods cattle. The definition is that they're in an early stage of breed development. So if you think of like a thoroughbred horse, they're in a late breed, or a poodle or a beagle. They have a real specific look, and you can right away conjure up a mental image of them. But for the English shepherds, the piney wood cattle, the Gulf Coast sheep, or the guinea hogs, you can't bring up quite as specific a picture. And they're in an early stage of breed development after being isolated to a local area where local production goals and the local physical environment drove the selection. So it may have, it had some human intervention, but a lot of time it had environmental intervention. So remember those Gulf Coast sheep. The ladies wanted wool that was easy to spin and soft next to the skin. And so their husbands selected for that. The environment, however, wanted to kill them. And the genes selected for the ability to thrive in heat, high humidity, and moisture so they wouldn't die out. Uh, Some Gulf Coast sheep are horned. Others are naturally pulled or hornless. Uh, Piney woods browsed in the woods instead of on pasture grasses. So they can get very fat on very little input. Uh, Different ranchers selected for different colors, and that helped them identify their herds at roundup time. Some guinea hog Breeders chose a miniature size that was popular in the 1990s. They called the different types of guinea hogs little boned or big boned. And some modern homesteaders still like them at that under 200 pound range. And that's as an adult. Others want something that will get to 245 pounds as soon as possible. The coats will vary from thick to thin to wavy or curly like a poodle or a mangalista. Um, I believe that the authors of Managing Breeds do that the biodiversity within a breed can really help it keep it healthy and survive for the future. So those genes are always there. They might be hidden, you know, within the different strains, but you can bring them out. And to save the different traits, some line breeding is needed or close breeding 
like cousins in a family to save those strains within a land race breed. So, no, but you have to know the tradition, you have to know the history, you have to know the different types. And so my book and my website are designed to help breeders understand the different genetic lines. And then if you go on my website, you can actually see photographs of the different genetic lines. So that helps continue the education. Awesome. Excellent. So, and I will definitely put a link to that book. I'll put a link to the, um, to your website and, and uh, so forth in the, in the show notes, but really a, a land race breed kind of to sum it up is, is a breed that has um, similar characteristics, but there's not really a, a standard that you have to breed for. Right. Instead of having a standard, there's a breed description. So the, associations can determine how much they want to enforce uh, the parameters of the breed description so that if it says that you know they only come in these colors that you you don't do other colors but that's usually kind of superficial with a land race so you look more at the size range like um, if the size range starts at maybe 130 140 pounds you don't want to be breeding them 60 pounds Right. And you don't want to really bre breeding to get to 600 pounds again, then it's no longer a guinea hog. So you try to keep kind of the old timey traditions going. And, and these are animals that never had breed associations until modern times, really since the Livestock Conservancy has been formed, they've helped start a lot of these breed associations so that we can preserve them. But if you look at Berkshire pigs or large black pigs, they've been bred for hundreds of years in Europe, highly standardized and a very specific breed standard of standard of perfection is what they call it in the rabbits and maybe some of the other breeds is that you have to to, to at least aim for that standard, and, and I think one of the one of the downsides to being standards driven, I think, is is proven out. And I think I'll just use one of the be best examples that I'm aware of is the German Shepherd, where a lot of German Shepherds have hip problems mm -hmm. um, as a result of breeding for standards, which has caused, ha in essence, has had unintended consequences. Um, over the years, just because of how the the standards being achieved, kind of what that's led to. Right. And those are usually AKC standards, which are more beauty contests, basically. And you have fads and preferences as to what you like, and they wanted that lean, that sloping mm -hmm. hip look. But then you also have the UKC, which are more performance standards for what the breed was meant Originally to do. Originally made for. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So it does get... Um, get pretty complicated, but I love to talk genetics. <laughs> and, well, and I, and I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, it's something that you can't, you can't just turn a blind eye to understanding, you know, genetics and, and going back to kind of your, your background with regards to the rabbits and okay, if I breed this one with this one, what am I going to get and how, what's the impact going to be on down the line? Um, you, you know, you, you've got to pay attention to that and understand that to ensure that you are not causing yourself issues uh, to where you're going, whether, whether it's a, um, a lack of mothering instinct or it's a, you know, a, a tendency to be aggressive or, um, you know, whatever. There's a lot of bad that you can pass on if you're focused only on either superficial traits or one particular, whether it's growth rates or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're not looking at the whole of the pig, um, then I, you know, you, you, you may be creating problems. Right. And if you're, if you're working with a heritage breed and you want to help preserve the breed, you want to preserve those qualities that makes it a good breed. So, so let me ask you this question. The American Guinea hog was traditionally a Southern breed. Mm -hmm. I'm in the North. Mm -hmm. Is, is that a problem when you think land race breed? Am, am I violating kind of that, um, the spirit of what a land race a land race breed is by doing American guinea hogs in the north when they're generally a southern breed. You know that's a a question that lots of people have debated. So there are lots of different uh, perspectives on that. But I think that 
they are doing really well in the north, and many most of them were actually in the north northern states when they were discovered and brought into the association. But when I went back to the histories and found out where this Pennsylvania breeder got their pig or where this Virginia breeder got their pig, they tell me, oh, Alabama, oh, Georgia, you know, oh, Mississippi. So um, that it's interesting that they were a southern breed, but they are adaptable. They're pigs. So pigs have adapted to a wide range of climates. And this particular breed has also adapted. But what is really beneficial in the south is that black coat, because mm-hmm. the black coat will protect them and the thick coat will protect them from sunburn. Whereas I've had white, I had some feeder pigs, and one of them had more white on it, and it would get sunburn under that pink skin. Under the white coat is pink skin with no pigment, but the black guinea hog also has dark pigment under under that black coat, even if it's shedding. It still has black skin. And yet that thick coat, which benefits it in the South, also benefits it in the North in the winter. Mm-hmm. So They'll just grow a heavier coat. Exactly. And and I think the, I think, you know, I, to, to kind of answer my own question, although I, I, is, is that I think that particularly with the situation that the American guinea hog finds itself in, although it has recovered some from where, where it was at, um, thank God, but um, we, we need people pitching in wherever they're at. So, Many people uh, might be surprised to learn that by 1990, this breed was almost extinct. And so why did the American guinea hog kind of fall out of favor? Well, that's one of the things that I researched in my book, and I interviewed a lot of people about that. And there were basically four factors. One was the demonization of fat and lard and the drive for leaner pigs. And that all came out of the Ansel Keys study and um, fat led to cholesterol and cholesterol led to heart attacks. And we know a lot of that research was is pretty iffy, but people stopped eating fat in the 1970s. And so people started breeding leaner pigs and there was the other white meat movement and all that I address in my book. Another factor is the small small loss of small farms and the mm-hmm. agri commissioner under Richard Nixon, Earl Butts, who said, get big or get out. You know, they wanted more factory farms. They wanted bigger farms. And so that was one thing. And then another was just loss of farmland to urban sprawl. People started moving from the country to the city and then from the city to the suburbs. There was less land, less homesteaders. And the fourth thing, and this is the one that that took me a while to figure out why, was the pet pig craze. In the 80s and 90s, there was a big pet pig craze. And so they were crossbreeding any smaller pigs they could find to improve the temperament, maybe, of these pet pigs. And so anytime you crossbreed animals, you lose the original animals because nobody's breeding the original animals. So it was really a real confluence of things that happened between the 60s and the 90s. And each one had an impact, and there was no organization. So that's what happened. And so from my understanding, in the mid-90s, when you know people kind of understood what was going on with regards to the American guinea hog, there there were about 200 American guinea hogs left in the United States. Is, 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 am I correct in that figure? It was, it was more like about 50. And we're talking about wow. breed, breeding pigs. And there were only, they were only able to find five or six farmers that were still growing them. And this would be a whole other story, but they thought that these farmers in different states had unrelated pigs, but they were all basically from one single farm that sold it to somebody that sold it to somebody that sold it to somebody. So they were all basically 90% of the initial hogs that started the Guinea Hog Association were from Annette Hester's farm and her hogs were from Mr. Hale and then Marsha Reed 
Dan Hale and Marsha Reed sold him his far, his her hogs, sold her her hogs. So it's just, it gets very convoluted, but it would take hours to explain mm. what happened. Right, right. But I mean, the, the fact is, at the end of the day, it was a, a significant um, limited uh, uh, amount of pigs. Yes, um, and they found about 35, and then a lot of those were neutered, you know, or they were living in mm-hmm. a zoo without a mate. And so it turned out being 11 hogs that started the AGHA. And so do you know what the current status is of the breed, like um, as far as the number that are in the registry? I really do not know um, what their numbers are, and I don't think the registry does because that usually takes a lot of sleuthing and homework. Um, it was originally re- listed as critical on the Livestock Conservancy's conservation priority list, and that's the lowest category, the most need. And then it moved up to the next level, which is threatened. And it's the priority list just came out this week, and they're still at threatened. Uh, I believe they've been there since about 2015, and there was a census that the Livestock Conservancy helped them with in, it was just before 2014. So they haven't really counted their numbers since then. It's really hard to complete a census because there's a lot of work involved with it. Last year, I helped the Conservancy and the Large Black Association with their first census since 2014. At the time, they had thousands of pigs on the books and hundreds of breeders listed. But I spent the better part of 10 months every day calling, emailing, looking them up on Facebook, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, texting, and everything to find these breeders. It turns out they have only 35 breeders left and 325 hogs that are registered left and so and it was just they knew that their count was off but they just didn't know what they had and Mm -hmm. it it takes a lot of money to do that kind of work a lot of time coming back to this week that's what this week is all about with regards to the focus on international heritage breeds um, is to to really bring to light the importance of this and and organizations like the Livestock Conservancy that are helping to fund those kinds of studies and to work with those kinds of associations to help those breeds um, continue on. Yes, and, and it's um, this kind of time intensive work that the Conservancy really helps the associations do. And this book, that I mentioned managing breeds, the subtitle is strategies for breeders and breed associations. And there's a whole section in there about how um, breed associations can uh, be most effective, how breeders can be most effective. So it's, it's a real favorite of mine. And that's part of what they do. They actually just got a $500,000 grant from the Manton Foundation to prop up the breed associations. So the Guinea Hog Association and many, many others will be getting some props. Um, right now, you know, this um, COVID-19 thing has made some things a little harder to implement, but they have hired somebody to head up that program and, and you'll be hearing more about it in the future. Awesome. Now, and I, and I, I mean, it's these organizations like the Livestock Conservancy, the American Guinea Hog Association that are doing really yeoman's work in, in helping um, continue on these, these breeds. And then obviously the breeders, um, not to pat myself too much on the back, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but people like us who are, who are out here um, in the trenches, you know, raising these pigs and trying to help uh, other people understand the benefits of the heritage breeds um, and in particular the benefits of the American guinea hog. And, and so I, I, you know, really appreciate you writing this book to, to as, as I said earlier, to help give people um, that backstory to the American guinea hog, what, why people uh, were raising these pigs, and, and to give people a bit of a connection to that. And hopefully that will help people um, in the future, uh, you know, have that sense of connection to where their food comes from. Yes. 
So before we wrap up, um, you have stepped away from raising livestock and uh, you've kind of made the next step on your homestead journey where you've downsized, you're trying to support local farmers and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, what do you miss most about your, your homestead when you had the, the livestock? Well, I just really love the connection to the animals because all these heritage breeds that were selected for temperament and selected to be on a small homestead, um, they were very family friendly and very gentle. And I just had that connection to the animals and I miss that. And I miss being out, seeing the change of the seasons and just walking from pasture to pasture to take care of my pigs and calling them by name. But I do not miss the 2 a.m. when the, <laughs> it's raining and the moon's full and I know that a lamb is due and it's pouring down rain and I need to get dressed and <laughs> go out there and check to make sure that nobody's in distress. Um, or when it's we're having flash floods and I just moved the pigs to a new place yesterday, but they've already mucked it all up because of the rain <laughs> and, mm -hmm. or they need to get on higher ground. So uh, I really hats off to all the breeders like you that are doing the hard work and keeping these breeds going. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm with you. I, I tell people all the time, um, and, and not that I, as long as I'm able to do it, I'm going to keep doing it. But um, in, this, in this era of Instagram and Pinterest, you know, where people are always focused on the pretty, mm -hmm. um, homesteading <laughs> and raising livestock is not always pretty. Not always pretty. And uh, yeah, those those moments of the the two o'clock in the mornings, or oh my goodness, um, there's this cold snap coming in that I wasn't anticipating, and now I've got to rig up a heat lamp, which I absolutely hate. But it's a matter of do I roll the dice on that or watch animals die? I mean, mm -hmm. it's those kinds of things that uh, certainly I, I can't say are on my high on my list of favorite things. So I'm sure I I wouldn't miss them either. Now, you are currently celebrating the one-year anniversary of the release of your book, um, and you have told me that you are continuing your research. Yes. It's, it's kind of like, um, I think, just about any project. You're never done with it. You just quit working on it. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your case, though, you haven't quit working on it. You published it. You've kept working on it, yeah. um, and you hope to publish an update. So any timetable on that? Um not really. Um, what I'm trying to do right now is just get little pieces out there on Facebook or on my blog. I do have a website. If you sign up for the newsletter, you get those updates. And actually, I've learned some new things about the Hester's herd recently. And what I know so far is going, is going to be on the Hester's page, the Hester's line bread page of my website on the gallery. So, um, but I am thinking about the a Homesteader's Guide to Raising Heritage Breeds, and I hope to just get some of these generic ideas about the importance of saving the breeds and how they do fit a homesteader's needs. Get some of that out there. That's going to be a follow-up book to, to your American Guinea Hog book is going to be a totally new book on the Homesteader's Guide to Raising Heritage. Breeds. Right. You may have noticed I have a lovely, I think, 17-page index to, to um, Saving the Guinea Hogs. And it, it takes a lot of money to hire an indexer, professional indexer. And if you change one page, if you add two or three pages to a book, then every, all the pages after that are going to be out of order as far as the index goes. So um, I, I'm kind of hesitating to writing a whole second edition. I think I'll give that a few years. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So you're going to focus on this uh, Homesteader's Guide to Raising Heritage Breeds. And then um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I, I think that'll be uh, something well um very important, and I think it'll be well received. So, uh, as we wrap this up, if people want to find more about you uh, or the American Guinea Hog, or if they want to purchase your book, how can they do that? Well, my website is www.guineahogbooks.com. I sell soft and hardcover books there, and I can autograph them before I send them out if you buy them from my website. Uh, they'll also come with award stickers because the book has won two awards, but they don't 
keep those stickers in the warehouse when they're printed. So those books are on sale now until supplies last. The sale ends May 31st. However, listeners from the Homestead Journey podcast can um, get a special coupon code after May 31st. So June 1st through the 20th. You can use the coupon code HJP20 for Homestead Journey Podcast and get 20% off while supplies last. And then you can get the ebook on Amazon. Amazon usually has the soft cover discounted and in stock, but not the hard cover. Also, Acres USA sells my book, soft cover book, and so does um, the Livestock Conservancy. Excellent. So a lot of places that you can get that book. Um, but if you, in June, from June 1st to June 20th, uh, if you order it straight from Kathy's website, then the coupon code you said was HJP20? That's correct. Um, HJP20. HJP20. I'm also on Instagram as at guinea hog books and on Facebook as Saving the Guinea Hogs or my personal page, Kathy R. Payne. Excellent. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for for being on the podcast. Again, I really, really have appreciated um, you taking the time out of your schedule to be here. I've enjoyed these discussions. I really admire and appreciate your um, commitment to uh, heritage breeds and in particular uh, to the American guinea hog. Um, and I And I really appreciate the fact that it's not just been that you've paid lip service to it, but that you have, uh, through your homesteading journey, the heritage breeds have really, really pay, uh, played an important um, part in that. And uh, so I, I think it's a, a really great template for other people to, to try to emulate. So as we kind of wrap up, um, this again is the end of the International Heritage Breeds Week. Did you want to say anything else with regards to the Livestock Conservancy? Yes, if you want to follow the hashtag hashtag Heritage Breeds Week and the Livestock Conservancy is at livestockconservancy.org and check them out and see what they're doing for Heritage Breeds Week. Excellent. So thank you so much. And I will have links to all of um, Kathy's social media, her website. I'll have uh, links to the Livestock Conservancy and uh, so again, thank you so much, Kathy. I really, really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed this. It's been quite a pleasure, Brian. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Take care. Well, folks, I know this episode has been very long, but I just really, really enjoyed the information that Kathy had to share. And as I was doing the editing, I just quite frankly couldn't cut anything. I figured I would just give it to you. That's the beauty of the podcast. Um, it's I know it's a dangerous thing to do. But I felt like it was just such great information that uh, it was important to just keep it all in there. So thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to me, Brian, at thehomesteadjourney.net. You can check us out at thehomesteadjourney.net. We're also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. So check us out there. All of the links are in the show notes. Uh, and until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.